As Billy mentioned, we're, we're in a, this series about breaking out of things that keep us bound, uh, not only from understanding and experience the fullness of Christ, uh, but understanding how we can uh, be a part of a family. So I guess in part, this, this guy apparently uh, belonged to a family and probably acted out a lot of things that we do at home that we wouldn't admit in public. And uh, usually it takes children to make us all honest. So I'm going to ask if you would to take your Bibles and turn to Galatians chapter 3. And uh, I'll continue this series. Pastor Jeff has, has begun. And today I'm going to talk about breaking out. Breaking out from legality to reality. And that has a lot to do with the passage here in chapter 3 as to what's going on with this, uh, this group of people in a place called Galatia. Now, the, the notes you'll see is blank. So you'll have to write things in um, if you want. Well, you'll see the major points up on the, on the screen. But I think it's important to begin that, that as we come to this passage again, these are, are Jewish believers. These are people who have followed uh, the law. They have followed those things that were a part of it down to the nitty gritty. Not just the law, but even the practical things that were found in uh, various, uh, I guess you call it a procedural manual called the, uh, the Talmud and the Mishnah. They, they think it, it got down to everyday work. I mean, if the wife burned the toast, it was justification for divorce. I mean, it was wild out there sort of things. And so understand these people come from a credible religious rubric that, that has legalities, I mean, to the finite element. Down to how you breathe, how you walk, how far you can walk on the Sabbath, how much you can't. I mean, it's just incredible. But the good thing is that these, believe, these, these Jewish people came to know Christ. And they had experienced a life-changing moment through the Spirit of God. So what is happening is that in this book, in chapter 3 in particular, uh, you have a group of people called the Judaizers. And what is happening is that Everything's going great, everything's wonderful, uh, and things are going along. And then there's these few people who decide, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This Christ thing is awesome. But guys, we are, we are Jews. I mean, we, we, we just can't throw out everything that we have been a part of. So they begin to interject very subtly. Uh, this idea that, you know, we can be a believer, but let's keep the law too. Let's do this and let's do that and, and continue to maintain that these things are important, the practices, the daily things, all the uh, things that are part of the law and the practice of being Jews. And so because of that, Paul is writing, and we see here in chapter 3, that he's writing and he's saying, guys, what happened? What are you doing? What has come into your midst to make you think that as a believer in Christ, you've got to go back and keep the law again? And so that's where we are, and that's the thing where I'm going to start with. So in chapter 3, verse 1, uh, let's read uh, verses 1 to 4. It says, You foolish Galatians. Some of the translations I looked at had something like, You crazy idiots. I, mean, I, I, I couldn't find that one again, but I thought it was really appropriate. It's kind of, what are you doing? Who has bewitched you? Who has uh, taken things and made an illusion? I mean, it's amazing how, how illusionists can make things look so real. And so he's, he's using a word that says, who has, has caused an illusion, caused, uh, given you a magic trick to take you back to a form of practice that Christ has freed you from. Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. I'd like to learn just one thing I want to get straight. 
Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to obtain your goal by human effort? Which is basically what the law was attempting to do. By human effort, I will do and accomplish these things, and therefore, if I can do them, I'll become righteous. It goes on to say towards the end of verse 4, have you, have you suffered so much for nothing? If it really was for nothing at all? So the first thing I want to, first major point I want to share is that God has planned, or God has a plan for spiritual vitality. God has, God has a plan for spiritual vitality. You've heard the phrase, I live by the spirit of the law, not the, the, law, not the letter of the law. Um, again, these people are trying to come back into such practices that restrict them, that, that it becomes all about them. It all, you know, faithfulness and, and the being blessed of God comes through how well I keep the law, how well I do certain things in my life. And so as a result, uh, we're going to, to, to keep those things and Paul is saying, you've got to be kidding. You heard. You heard the message of the resurrected Christ. You have experienced the fullness of the Spirit of God. And He has changed your life. What are you doing? What are you doing in practicing the law? God wanted them to know the spiritual vitality and the plans that he had for, for them. In fact, towards the end of this verse we just read, he said, after your goal by human efforts, did you try to accomplish these things? No, God has it all planned out. God has a purpose. In fact, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, from the new message, or the message, it says, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not to abandon you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Now, Jeremiah was preaching to those and saying, look, guys, it may not look pretty. The idea of you going into a foreign country and being in captivity uh, for some 70 years, you may think God has abandoned you. You think if God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, he can do all things. He can park the waters. He can feed you quail in the middle of nowhere. And surely, uh, they're not going to allow King Neb Short for Nebuchadnezzar. You know, I know him on a personal basis, meaning King Ned. Surely God's not going to allow these guys to take you into captivity. And Jeremiah is saying, yes, he is. But don't forget that even in the midst of something you think you don't get, you think in your mind you can't worship but only in Jerusalem, so you're going to be in a foreign country and you're thinking already, how can we religiously legally, so to speak, worship God in another country. And he says, you know what? God has, he has it all planned out. You don't understand it, but God has plans for you to give you a future and a hope. And indeed he did. So what is it that we're breaking free from in our spiritual lives that, that has taken away the vitality? The vitality of somehow in my spiritual life I need to break out of this sort of rut, this sort of spiritual rut, a, a sense of emptiness, and, and seemingly you've lost the cutting edge. You've lost that sense of uh, joy and effervescence of, of uh, living in the fullness of the Spirit of God. Perhaps it's not about going back to, to the law for you. I certainly hope not. But I think sometimes we, in the midst of... Uh, Growing in Christ, we have a tendency that when we we really mess up, and we all do, by the way, um, we have those moments that somehow our life that is a part of, of what we know, what we believe, and yet we somehow disappoint God in the process. We kind of go back to these sort of put your life in neutral. Have you ever been there? I mean, whether it be a job or with your family or your driving or your thinking. And uh, all of these things are coming across your mind, but in fact, you kind of got things in neutral. God says, I want to bring about a sense of vitality in your life. 
part of what we're going to conclude today at the end of this message is how we can break out of those legalities, so to speak, in our life. Secondly, God not only has a plan for spiritual vitality, but God has a plan, or God has a place, rather, in His family for you. God has a place in His family just for you. Let's look, if you would, back in the, the text here, verses 5 through 7. Does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law? See the question? See, see he's continuing to go back to the law. He's hitting this thing over and over and over again because they know better. They know better. Does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law? I mean, you can see that here the sarcasm. You've got to be kidding. Because you believe what you heard. You heard the message of the gospel. Not the practice of the law. You heard. You know the truth. Consider Abraham, he says. Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are children of God. Abraham, because he believed. Not because of the law. Not because of traditions. Not because of things he feels like would make him a good citizen. Uh, it was a matter of Abraham believed God. And it was accredited to him as righteousness. See, God has a place in his family for you. But I think so many of us, maybe because of our nature, maybe it's the Western mindset, maybe it's just pure uh, it's trust. Uh, with all the things that are in the life that we live, we got this idea that if it's too good to be true, it probably isn't true. And so along comes the message of the gospel that says there's not a thing you can do to earn the favor of God. There's nothing you can do to save yourself from sin. There's nothing you can do to be a righteous person continually and faithfully because you will screw up. You will. So understand that what has happened in your life, if you come to know Him, it was the total work of a sovereign God who came and chose you. 